No pastors away today. But we're here to have a good time in the Holy Ghost today. I'm going to believe that. Amen. I think I want to get um, into the word this morning. Take a little time with you. How many of you know that sometimes you just need to take time in the word? You have to take time with God. Don't you need to take time with God? Amen. And God's word, the entrance of God's word is what brings life. It brings life. You and I received life because God's word has entered into us. And when God's word enters into us, it brings forth life. Amen. So we have the word, right? In the beginning, the word, the word was with God. The word was God. Same in the beginning with God. All things made by him and without him was not anything made, right? In him was life and the life of all men and the light shined in darkness. Darkness couldn't apprehend it, right? And it said, and then the word came, became flesh. And then as many as believed in him, and I'm just breaking up the text there, so I don't want to go through the whole thing, but as many as believed in him, he gave them that power to become, to become, I like that, to become sons of God. And so I just, it's not where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on this morning, but I'm adding that in there because I want you to know how important it is to come and get into that word and know God. And I want to, and I want to talk about knowing God. How many of you know God? How many of you know what God has for your life and the purposes for your life? So let's talk about knowing God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 40, I call it, it's called the gospel of Isaiah because if you go down to chapter 40, we see reference to the voice crying in the wilderness and we know that is reference to John the Baptist and we see um, reference to the shepherd um, who would come and, and comfort his sheep. Um, but in Isaiah chapter 40, there's something very powerful there is that in the whole book of Isaiah up to chapter 40, there's a lot of... Um, kind of judgment, chastisement. How many of you like judgment and chastisement? So we'll leave the first 39 out. How's that sound? But in chapter 40, what it does is God shifts it because there are times when God will shift things to bring us to a place where we can really know him. Because there are many, many times in our life we only know God as like... Um, People know God or have a concept of God like he's this judging God, condemning God, and um, right? Some God that's ready just to beat us at any, at any point in, the, in our life. Um, and if, if we do wrong, he's so eager to come and judge us and condemn us and beat us and leave us for dead. But how many of you know I don't serve that kind of God? Aren't you glad you don't serve that kind of God? Aren't you glad that you serve the kind of God that is there to meet you even when you blow it and you know it? That kind of God that's there. Um, yeah, he will chasten us and he will work in our lives to correct us. Give us a tune up or a check up from the neck up, right? Um, but there are times when God um, comes to us and he, he speaks to us. And as he speaks to us, he reveals his very nature, his very character. And there are times he reveals what he's going to do for us, in us, through us. God working for me, right? God working in me. God working through me. And so Isaiah chapter 40 is very powerful because starting in verse 1, here's what it says. Comfort ye Comfort my people, saith God. Speak comfortable to, for his glory. Christian assembly. To Jerusalem. Cry out to her that her war is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain shall be brought low, the crooked place shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, 
for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. For the voice says, cry out. And he says, what shall I cry out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But watch this. But the word of God stands forever. Give God a praise. Amen. The word of God stands forever. Go down to verse 25. And I'm going to try to cut through it. I, I could preach this whole chapter. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out the host by number. He, he calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my ways are hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Now, ready? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord of, and the creator of the heavens and earth, neither faint nor is weary? His, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth, listen, young people, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. See, we have so many young people in here. Here's what he's saying. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Give God, that's God's word. Kind of broken up into pieces, so, but I'm going to pull it all together. Toza was right when he said, our supreme need, our supreme need is to know God. Is to know God. There's something in all of us that we just got to know about God. We, we've, but from the time we're born, it's built within us that, that we, we know that there's, everybody knows there's something out there. I read an article one time about a tribe in Africa that a plane was flying and it crashed. And because it fell out of the sky, this particular tribe began to worship it. There's, there's something inside of us that, that needs to know God. How many of you remember when you just needed to know about God? And you needed more in your life and you needed something in your life. And, and, and what that was is to, is God. Because the only one that can fill that, that void in my life is the one that created us. Come on, right? The only one that can, can fill that space in my heart is the one. It's not material things. It's not how much I have. Or it's not how good looking I make myself. It's, it's not how good looking I am. It, it's not prestige. It's not position. It's not success. It's not how, who's got the biggest TV. They're getting bigger and bigger because there's something here.
pit, so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Isn't that intense? I mean, she was in a Nazi concentration camp. She saw people executed, and she realized in the midst of all of that, there's no pit that God's love can't reach. Because, see, what she did was she came to a revelation in her difficulty of God and an aspect of God that no matter what I go through, his love is deeper still. Come on, somebody. Hey. So knowing God, what do I need to know about God? Brother Traffic, here's what I want you to know. Write this down. God is more than enough. God is more than, say more than enough. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more than enough, abundantly. That means more than enough. He is more than enough for me. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? He is more than enough. Isaiah began to show us something in chapter 40, around verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. And when he gives these comforting words to the, his people, like the God's giving you these comforting words, he said, tell them I'm more than enough. How did he do that? First of all, by telling him that the war is over. There's no more comforting words than when God says that the war is over. You've been fighting a battle. You've been going through spiritual warfare. You've been living in defeat. Everything you have, prosperity, you name it, has been robbed because a thief comes to kill and to steal and destroy. He said, but you tell them that the war is over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stop fighting the fight. You hear what I'm saying today? Stop fighting the fight. The war is over. What do you mean? Stop fighting the fight. I mean this. Allow God to fight the fight for you. Too many of us are reading out all this spiritual warfare and all this other stuff. He said, you tell them the war is over. I believe that the war is over. How many of you find yourself every time you turn around, I'm in some spiritual battle. I'm being defeated by the devil. The, de the devil's always doing this. The devil's always doing that. Just say, the war is over. I don't fight this battle. He fights my battles. Maybe the war is not over because I'm trying to fight a battle that Jesus Christ fought 2,000 years ago on Calvary. That I'm trying to defeat something that he already defeated. Amen. I love what Paul said to Timothy. He didn't tell Timothy about fighting no spiritual war. Here's what he told him. He said, Timothy... Fight the good fight of faith. What does that mean? That I need to stand in faith, and I need to trust in the Lord, and I need to have faith in God. In the whole armament of Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate, the loins good about with truth, preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he makes a little statement there, above all. Take the shield of faith. You're fighting the fight of faith. And when the enemy comes at you, he wants to rob your faith. So you don't believe in the one that's able to do exceedingly and abundantly far beyond all that you could ask or think. The one that fought the fight. The one that brings the victory. The one that gives you the victory. 
the one that gave me the victory. Because this is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith. Come on and give God a praise in here today. I see so many people walking around moaning and crying. Listen, stand in faith. The Moabites are on one side. The Amorites are on the other side. And, and Jehoshaphat, he calls this fast, and they stop praying. The enemy is coming against me. The enemy is defeating me. And here's what God said. Send out the praise team. Where are you, worship team? Send out that worship team. Now, the worship team is like, I don't know if I want to go first. All of these Amorites and Moabites are all armed and deadly. They could kill me. But he said, you send them out to worship me. You put the focus on this whole church, the focus of your whole life on me. That's faith. Now, I don't know who the first guy went out. I don't know if he had symbols on his knees because they were shaking so much. But he went out, and he said, praise you, God. Thank you, God, that the Amorites and, and the Moabites are being defeated because it's not by power. It's not by might. But your spirit, Lord of hosts. And then he said to the church leadership, and then he said to Jehoshaphat, and he said, listen, Jehoshaphat, all you got to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So I'm living like in this victory these days because I realize that all I have to do is put faith in the one that defeated him 2,000 years ago. Amen? Always, oh, no, listen. Michael the archangel contending for the bone of Moses says the Lord rebuke you. Remember David when he went on the battlefield? He didn't even have any idea that he was going on the battlefield. He pulled a little cart with the lunch on it for his brothers. Give him some bread and some cheese and some wine to his brothers. And trying to find out what's happening. Next thing you know, David finds himself right in the thick of things. Why did David find himself in the thick of things? Because, see, David wasn't trusting in arms, the Saul, Saul's armor. David wasn't trusting in any weapon tree, spears, and chap. He was trusting his faith was in God. So when they all fled and everybody's negative and they're hiding in their tents, oh, these are Philistines, oh, Goliath, and, and, and they're all paranoid, and what are we going to do? We're defeated. David kind of steps up in faith. They're defeated in spiritual warfare because that hairy, audacious thing that's in front of them scaring the life out of them. I don't think I'm ever going to get off this one point. <laughs> And David steps out on the battlefield. And he's got five stones, and you know the whole story. I won't have to go through it. But something that David said. He said, I come in the name of the Lord, God of Israel. He said, I'm not fighting this one. I'll throw the stone. I'll do the practical things. I'll do my part, but I know God's got a greater part because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. See, if you can get this philosophy, take this principle and put it in your tool belt, is that he already fought the battle. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. Why? Because he's under Jesus' feet. And you know who I walk with? I don't walk. He doesn't walk beside me. He doesn't walk behind me. He doesn't walk above me. He walks in me. He is in you. When you walk, he walks. When you talk, he talks. He moves in you. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. So there's no reason... For us to be in defeat today. Am I right? 
Why? Because the war is over. Maybe i got to preach this just a little more because I'm not getting released yet. Jesus said, I have the keys of death and hell. Sin has no dominion over you. Satan has no dominion over you. Paul writes in the Romans, who you yield yourself servants to obey, though that's the servant you become. The enemy had no authority in your life. Somebody's got to hear this in here today. He's on my back. Pull him off and put him down where he belongs. Put a sign up that says no access. Like the song used to sing, for the king is in residence here. These are comforting words for me. To know my God and to know that the war is over. And the battle belongs to him. Paul tells the Corinthians, we are more than what? Say it again. Through Jesus Christ. Or by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ, you are more than conquerors. More than a conqueror. How many of you believe you're more than a conqueror? Through Jesus Christ. Everybody say through. How many of you have Jesus living on the inside? Oh, what a change in my life. How many of these walking with you? Beside you? Back of you? Above you? Where is he? You are the temple of who? Come on, somebody. Get this today. This is liberating stuff. You don't have to deal with torment, depression, defeat, despair. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he said one word. Oh, three. It is finished. <laughs> it is finished, to be politically correct. What does it mean? Finito. Done. Over. Kaput. The war has been accomplished. The battle has been won. Hallelujah. You see, guys like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they got it. Daniel got it. They overcame by faith. The sword, the lion's den, they overcame all this because they got it. They got this whole thing. They get, it just clicked with them. Heroes, Hebrews chapter 11. They all got it. By faith they did this. By faith they did that. They conquered. They won the war. They won battles. They got it. Somehow it just clicked. And they got it. Amen? I got to back off of this, but I can't. Can I stay here for just a few more minutes? Comforting words. The war is over. The war is over. Everybody say the war is over. Say the war is over in my heart. The war is over in my head. The war is over in my house. Because he's walking in me. Come on. Isn't that the truth? It's the enemy tells you you're defeated, you can't do it, you'll never conquer Gideon sitting in there in the wine press, and he said, you rise up and you defeat that enemy, you warriors, and I can't do it, they can't show me this, show me that, show me this. We all need some kind of confirmations all over the place. And here's what the Lord said, you get up. You start pulling down those things that don't belong in your house. You start getting rid of those things that are not of God. He went into his father's house and pulled down the idols and destroyed them. He did it at night. He didn't walk up in the middle of the day. He kind of did it in his own time, in his own way, but he did it. He got rid of things that were not of God in his life, and as he did, he started seeing victory. After victory, 
after victory till the Midianites were totally destroyed because they put faith in God and begin to operate in what God tells them. If you say, I, I, I can't defeat it, well, just listen to what God tells you. Do what God tells you. Walk according to his word and you'll walk in victory. Come on, give my hand clap praise. I got to hit this in just a couple. I gave you a lot and so little. One more thing for the one that needs to hear this. God fights our battles. I can't go. I can't leave. If you're defeated, you're fighting your own battle. If you find yourself running instead of being pursued, instead of pursuing, you're fighting your own battle. Oh, that's some good stuff, right? Is that good stuff or not? Is that gospel? Is that the pill we needed to take today? I listen to people all the time that have been defeat. I want to live in victory. I want to serve the Lord with gladness, joy unspeakable and full of glory. I don't want to be running around chasing my tail every time I turn around. The war is over. Tell somebody say the war is over. Are you ready? Does he say? He says your sins are pardoned. Your sins have been pardoned. Stop dealing with the old things you did in your life when God's pardoned your sin. Let go. Oh, come on. Let it go. Your sins have been pardoned. Did Jesus Christ pardon our sins? Did he forgive us our sins? No guilt. No regret. No remorse. Because if anyone's in Christ Jesus, he's a brand new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things are becoming new. See, what the enemy tries to do is bring you back to your old life, your old sins, your old ways, all going all the way back to 1940, 1930, whatever, 1950. Some of you are not that old, but 1980, whatever. And then he pulls you all the way, 1999, but it goes all the way back to some stupid thing you did back then, and you can't ever get over it. You won't ever get over it. You're living with guilt. You're living with remorse. But he said, I pardoned your sin. As far as the east is from the west, I remember it no more. When the enemy brings up accusation, you have an advocate with the brother, with the father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Oh, I did this, and oh, I did that. Yeah, but he did. Look what he did. Get out of your own head. Your sins have been forgiven. Remember, if I only did this, that would happen. How do you know? How, how do you know? If you went back for your whole life and fixed all the things you thought would have, you'll still be you. Some of the things you went through made you better. Some of the stupid things we did made us smarter. <laughs> Some of the experiences we went through in our life made us a little wiser. When I was a kid, I touched the stove. And guess what? I never touched it again. Because I learned. And when I was forgiven of my sin, I'm saved. You don't have to run around walking around him. I saved. You accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Believe he died and rose again from the dead. You're saved. I got saved. Amen? How many of you are saved? You're walking around wondering if you're saved. I wonder if I'm saved. I deal with people all the time. I don't know if I'm saved. I said, you accept Jesus Christ as he died on the cross for you? That's faith, right? Then you're saved. You living for God? Yeah. Then you're saved. You allowing him to work in your life? Yeah. Then you're saved. I don't know if I'm saved. Anybody in here ever do have that issue? Come on. When I got saved, I got saved every service. I made every preacher that I ever, every church I ever went, went to visit, I made them happy because I'd get up and get saved. Who needs Jesus? Oh, I need Jesus? One day I was with my brother, and I went to get up, and he grabbed my pants. He said, sit down. I said, why? He said, you're already saved. He 
See, I'm trying to work out something that's a free gift. He, we didn't pardon ourselves of our sin. He pardoned us of our sin. He walked into the courtroom where I was going to be accused of being guilty of crimes. And Jesus walked in there and said, hold it. I'll take it. I'll take the death sentence for Tim Trafford. And then he looked at me and said, now go. Woman caught in adultery. What did he say? Go and do what? Sin no more. Isn't that good stuff? Lift your hands up and give God praise. Isn't that knowing God? Knowing that my sins are, yeah, but what if I sin? He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I can always come to a loving and forgiving God. Comfort my people and tell them that the war is over. The enemy is defeated. Tell them that their sins have been pardoned. For I have forgiven them. What a wonderful thing. I'm forgiven. You ever do something rot rotten? No, I don't answer that. To somebody and they forgave you? And you walked around with this in you for so long, grieving, didn't, hands sweating, thinking about getting and coming in contact with that person? And they embraced you and they forgave you like Jacob and Esau. Whoa, 20 years it took. But he hugged his brother's neck and forgave him. And Pete asked the question, how many times should I forgive Matthew? That's what many think, my brother. Seven? Because, see, we have about a limitation on what we will do. I forgive him seven times, but after that. Isn't that true? I forgive you two or three times, but, but Jesus said 70 times seven. Man. Why? Because how many times did he forgive me? 70 times seven. The woman that came to Jesus and, and she snuck in the back room and fell down at his feet and was weeping at his feet. And Simon said, if you knew what kind of woman this was, he would snatch you off of his feet. And Jesus says, since I come in here, you didn't wash my feet, but since I've been in here, this woman hasn't stopped crying and wiping her, my, the tears off with her hair. They that have been forgiven much will love much. Come on, right? How many of you have been forgiven? How many of you love them? Come on, lift your hands up, right? All right, let me hit you with some fast ones real quick. One, two, three, and we're out. Everybody say we're going to be out in a minute. Ready? Tell them. I love this stuff. You know why? Because it's encouraging, but it's God's word. Every uh, valley. No, you, you get this? Every valley will be changed. How many of you are going through a valley? Come on, be honest, right? You're going through a valley? Here's what he said. Comfort my people. Speak this word. I'm going to take that valley, and I'm going to make it high. I'm going to take you out of the valley. God will take you out of the valley. And if you're going through it, he'll be with you. Because he said, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for God is with me. But he said, look, and I'm going to straighten out that valley. I'm going to take you out of your valley situation. David said, I was in a horrible pit. I was up in the marker in the miry clay. But he lifted me up, and he set my feet upon a rock. He's going to pull me out of the valley. Today, God will lift you up out of the valley. In the valley of Baca, in the valley of trouble, the Bible says there's a door of hope. And God will lift you up out of that valley. God will take you out of that deep. And death. There is no depth too deep. That God's love can't reach me still. Oh, God, lift your hands up right now. Oh, God, I'm coming out of that valley because you're lifting me up out of this valley. You're taking me up out of this valley. Your word declares it, God, that you will make that valley. You will change that valley. Hallelujah. You will lift me up out of that valley. Come up out of that valley in the name of Jesus. Come up out of that valley in the name of Jesus. Come up out of that valley in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. 
Thank you, Jesus. I'm coming out of that valley because you made a way. You are my door of hope. Hallelujah. You're my way out. I don't know how I got in, but I know how I'm coming out. Hallelujah. I know how I'm getting out of this valley. Oh, I'm saying this comforting word to you today that God's going to lift you up out of that valley today. You're coming up out of that valley today. You don't need to stay in that valley when he promised that he'll take you up out of that valley. He leads me. He is my shepherd. And Father, in Jesus' name, God, I'll take that valley right now. Raise those that are in that valley situation right now. Change that valley. Change that valley in Jesus' name of defeat, of despair, of discouragement, of doubt, negativity, of fear and unbelief in Jesus' name. That dark place, that hollow place, that place, God, where I'm, I feel like I'm all by myself, that lonely place, that empty place. Oh, God, that place that caused me to become so bitter. I'm stuck in this valley. I'm stuck in this rut. And I can't get out of it. I'm talking to somebody in here today. He said, I'll lift you up out of that valley. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, hallelujah. I'm coming up out of that valley. I'm coming out. I don't belong in this valley. I'm seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm above and not beneath. The head, not the tail. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm blessed of the Lord. I don't belong in this valley. I'm coming out. Hallelujah. I'm coming out in the name of Jesus. I'm coming out because Jesus came to bring me out. He descended and he also ascended and led captivity captive. I'm part of those that are ascending out of that valley today. In Jesus' name. Whoo. Come on. Give him a praise. One more. Every mountain, every mountain shall be laid low. What does it mean? There are obstacles that have gotten in your way. There are things you feel that you can't overcome. Your destiny has been changed and altered because the obstacle that is in your way. But he said, I'm going to blow that obstacle out of your way. You get that word? He said, I'm going to move that obstacle out of your way. See, you tried to go over it, can't go over it, can't go under it, can't go around it. You've got to go through it. The only way is to go through it. And that's why Jesus told the church, he said, if you speak to it, it'll move. I can't achieve it because things are hindering me. It's a roadblock. It's a stumbling block. There's something in my pathway. But he said every mountain should be laid flat. Come on. You got an obstacle in your way? It's going to be laid flat. You got a valley you're in? You're going to be raised up. Come on, church. You've been in a war? You're coming out. You got the victory. You're out of the valley. The mountains moved out of your way. Because of why? Because of the one who's gone before us. He's prepared the way for us. Hallelujah. There's a voice crying in the wilderness. said, prepare the way of the Lord. Come on, I'm, I'm the voice today. I'll cry in the wilderness. I'll cry to those that are in some wilderness situation. Because God will take you out of that wilderness. Take you out of that wandering. Move that mountain out of your way. Two more things he said. He said, the crooked path will be made straight. That means the way you used to go back that old crooked way, where the enemy tries to lead you, God's going to straighten it out. You're not going back to the old ways. You're not going back to the old habits. Because God will straighten out that crooked path. He'll lead you on the upward way, a straight and narrow way. So I can't go back to the drugs. I can't go back to the alcohol because there's no path for me to go back there. He's crooked. The crooked path has been made straight. Isn't God good? He straightened you out. And he straightened the way out for you today. The Bible says, lead me not into temptation. 
When God sets you free, you get set free indeed. So the crooked paths will be made straight. The mountains are being removed. The valleys you're coming out of. The war has been over. And the rough places are being made smooth. I don't have time to preach on this. I could preach all day on this part. There are rough places in my life that because of his presence in my life, he has smoothed them. Go like this. You're smooth right now, right? Because God has smoothed out the rough areas of my life. He's changing me. He's changing me. God, you've got to know that God is more than enough. More to get you out of that war. More to bring you out of that valley. Pardon your sin. More than enough. More than enough to move the mountain. More than enough to make the crooked path straight. More than enough to move the rough edges. He's more than enough. How does it happen? 28 says this. Even the young will faint and get weary. But they that wait on God. You hear what I'm saying? They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. What is this covering? It's covering every aspect of your life. You're going to walk in victory. You're going to run. Amen? And you're going to walk and not be weary. You're going to run and not faint. He's going to restore you like the eagle. And he's going to begin to rise you up. And you're going to not only look at yourself and everything else and see it in a brand new way. Why? Because you're going deep with God. Because you're knowing God. Amen? L let's stand together. Father, in Jesus' name, so much I could say, so much more that could be said, but I think enough has been said. God, we need to know you, that you are more than enough. And I spoke to some areas this morning, and I want to close with this altar call. We talked about a lot of points, but we really hit that war. We were all over that war. So I want to say to you that are here today, and maybe some of you need to come down and just cry out with praise to God that the war is over. The war is over for me. Lift your hands and say, the war is over. And maybe some of you need to come down and say, you know what? I'm going to grab a hold of this whole idea that Jesus defeated it. I have the victory today, and the war is over for me. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to come right now, real quickly. We're going to pray. The war is over. Come on, the war is over. It's not your fight any longer. It's not a fight between you and somebody else. The war is over. The battle is over. I got the victory today because the war is over. God's more than enough. I'm waiting on the Lord today. The war is over. The war is over. The war is over. War is over in my house, my home, my relationship. I got the victory. No weapon formed against me shall prosper because he gave me, he's given me the victory. No weapon in church is going to be formed. It, it didn't say it won't be formed against you. It said it will not prosper. Because God has disarmed the enemy. Just stand in faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Extend your hand in faith and say, I got the victory in Jesus' name. The war is over. The war is over. The war is over. My sin has been pardoned. Your sin has been pardoned. You're dealing with sin. You're dealing with a sin issue that Jesus Christ died for. Come on down today and say, thank you, Jesus, that you pardoned me of my sins. That the debt has been paid. That I have been forgiven because you paid the price for me. You pardoned me for my sins, God. Thank you, God, that you forgive me of my sin. 
We always want to deal with the sin issue. We need to deal with the Christ issue. If Christ is in me, sin won't be. If Christ is living in my heart, sin will not have dominion over my life. Maybe it's not really a sin issue. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe it's whom I yield myself servants to obey is that who servant I'm becoming today. But he's pardoned my sin. He's cleansed me from iniquity if I call on him. He's faithful and just to forgive me from my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray that you release your people from guilt, condemnation. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. I'm looking for people to be set free today, God. That they will come out of that valley that they're in right now. Lord, lift them up. You've been in that valley. Come on. I want to come forward real quickly. You're in that valley. You're in that valley. Don't stay in your pew and your seat. Come forward. Something's going to happen as you step out. As you take that step of faith, you're going to walk towards this front. And as you're walking for this front, I'm believing you're coming out of that valley today. You said, well, I've been there too long. Here's what Jesus said. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Father, free us from being in that valley situation. Things that have drove us in there, God. Things that have drove us down into a depth. There's no depth where your love cannot reach still. God, by your love, by your grace, by your mercy, walk down through that valley of my brothers and my sisters today and lift them up. Bring them up out of that valley, God, in Jesus' name. God, I pray, God, that this will be a season, Lord, this, um, these holiday seasons, God, a, a Christmas time and Thanksgiving, New Year's, God, people go into this funk. God, help them to walk with a joy in their spirit. Joy in their life, serving you, God. Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, move the mountains, the obstacles that are in our way. So I can step into the gifting and the dream and the calling that you placed upon my life. God, you call me out of darkness into your marvelous light. Come against every hindrance, God, every obstacle, because we move in faith, God. We go through that Red Sea. We go through that Jordan. We're going to watch the Jericho walls fall down, overcome those Jebusites, God, everything in our way. You said everywhere the soles of your feet shall try, Joshua, you shall be prosperous and successful. God, in Jesus' name, everything that's keeping me from that destiny, straighten out the crooked paths and the rough places, God. We're waiting on you, Father. You said there would be renewal and revival if we wait on you. God, cast vision in the hearts of your people, God. Revival if we wait on you. He will renew you. Lift your hands up right now all over this church for renewal right now. Oh, hallelujah. Father, let the baptism of your spirit fall over this place right now.